Okay, so welcome to my talk about uh, auto scaling Apache Kafka. My name is Jakub Scholz. I work as an engineer at uh, Red Hat, and I'm also a maintainer of the Strumzy project. And uh, occasionally, I'm also uh, Apache Kafka contributor. Uh, if you don't know what Strumzy, then Strumzy is a CNCF incubating project which focuses on running uh, Apache Kafka on Kubernetes. So we provide. Uh, operators for running all the different server components of, uh, of Apache Kafka, but we also have operators for managing things such as users, topics, connectors, and we have some other smaller tools to make it easier to use uh, Kafka on, uh, on Cube. And uh, yeah, maybe on the beginning, uh, we can touch on why auto-scaling uh, Apache Kafka brokers might be interesting, why it might matter. Well. Uh, Kafka is quite often uh, a pretty big workload, which is taking quite a lot of resources. So yeah, if we manage to auto-scale it in some effective and efficient way, maybe we can save some costs, maybe we can uh, save some energy, be a bit more uh, green uh, or uh, something like that. So, so that's why we uh, looked into it. And uh, maybe a bit untraditionally, let's start the talk with uh, the first part of a, of a demo. So here in my Kubernetes cluster, I have already a Kafka cluster deployed. So what we can see here is that uh, right now I have here three brokers, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, remember that uh, for later. Uh, I'm not using Zookeeper anymore. I'm using this craft thing, which is new in Kafka. So I have these three controllers uh, as well to manage the quorum and so on. And then I have these additional tools which Streams use. Cruise control is for cluster rebalancing. It's a, it's a tool from LinkedIn. Then uh, this entity operator, that's what I mentioned for managing users and, uh, and topics. And this Kafka exporter is just for some additional metrics. And then, uh, yeah, this is the main Streams operator which is actually running this, uh, this cluster. And uh, so what I'm going to do right now on the beginning is uh, I'm going to deploy my load. So this just creates some Kubernetes jobs, which will create a bunch of pods. And uh, yeah, they will start uh, producing uh, a load of messages and consuming the load of messages. And uh, yeah, hopefully later when we get back to the demo, we should see that some auto-scaling happened. And uh, yeah, if not, then uh, yeah, something didn't work. So in the meantime, while it's hopefully auto-scaling, we can get back to the, to the slide. Uh, and uh, we can talk a bit more about the difference between scalability and elasticity. Because uh, quite often, when you mention Kafka, then for a lot of people who work with it, scalability is the first thing which comes to people's mind. So uh, why do we need to talk about how to auto-scale it if it's so scalable? But there's a difference between scalability and elasticity, right? And the, the scalability in which Kafka really excels is this kind of thing where you start maybe with the free brokers uh, in your cluster when you start your project or company. You usually start with free for the availability and reliability. But then you get the first customers. You maybe onboard new services, new users. So yeah, you can grow the cluster. And, uh, if you are still doing well, if you are becoming the new LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, whatever, then you can grow even more and more and more. And actually, it's, uh, Kafka can really scale well. And having tens of brokers or even hundreds, it's not necessarily something what's, uh, what's impossible. But when we talk about elasticity, we talk a bit more about kind of this uh, reaction to the immediate demand. So some advertisement somewhere showed or someone wrote about your project on, on Reddit or Hacker News, and suddenly, for a few minutes, you start getting in a whole bunch of new users. Uh, so you need to scale the cluster up. But then after a few minutes, you are the old news. Uh, you know how it goes these days. So yeah, you need to scale down again because you don't need really the, the performance. So, so that's more the the elasticity, and that's usually where the auto-scaling fits a bit more to kind of react to the immediate demand uh, which you might have from the applications using uh, something like Kafka. And uh, to be honest, the scalability part, the kind of more mid-term, long-term scalability to grow with your company, with your project, Kafka does that very well. 
the elasticity part, the part that's not so, so simple and so easy. And uh, yeah, so that's what we try to improve in, uh, in Strumzy. And uh, yeah, pretty much this talk is the journey which we took to, to get there. So the first thing, if you want to do some auto scaling on Kubernetes, then uh, yeah, the first thing what you need to do is you need to have your scale sub-resource. Now, if you use deployment or stateful set that has that kind of built-in from Kubernetes, but if you are operator like a Strumzy and you have the custom resources, it's something what ne you need to have supported in the custom resource and in your operator. And it's the scale sub-resource which basically allows Kubernetes to kind of scale the resource without really understanding the uh, internal structure of the custom resource. So thanks to that, you can do something like kubectl scale uh, Kafka node pool brokers uh, to five replicas. And Kubernetes will know exactly what to do. All to the Kafka node pool resource is something Strimzy came up with, and it has nothing to do with, uh, with Kubernetes itself. And uh, this is also where you plug in the horizontal pod autoscaler which is the kind of basic Kubernetes resource which you can use to autoscale things based on some metric, get them uh, up, increase the number of replicas, or down to decrease the number of replicas. So this was the first thing which we, uh, which we did in Strimzy. And uh, yeah, it got us uh, one step forward. So it got us to something like uh, this. So we can now scale the cluster. But if we start with something like free node Kafka cluster, which has some partition replicas assigned to the free nodes, then uh, yeah, when the scaling happens, new node is added to the cluster. But it's it, it's empty. And that's because in Kafka, all the partition replicas, they are assigned to one of the brokers. And if you just add more brokers to the cluster, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they will move around. Right, so you edit the node. Sometimes that's fine for this kind of long-term scaling. That's fine because you will maybe onboard new services, new applications, add new topics, and these will be created on the new node. So over the time, they will fill in. But for the auto-scaling, this doesn't really help. Similarly, what happens when you scale down the cluster? So let's now imagine we have a four-node cluster, which doesn't have the fourth node empty, but it's already in use. And it's, uh, yeah, pretty underutilized, so let's scale it down to three brokers. Well, it's not that simple, right? Because the broker number four, which we would maybe try to scale down, it holds the data. And if you would just delete the pod, then we would lose the data, right? Now, uh, maybe it would just break the availability of your cluster. Maybe it would actually cause some data loss which for some data which wouldn't be replicated on the other nodes. But you can't do it that simply. So that's why in Strumzy we created something what we called auto-rebalancing. And it's a feature of the Strumzy operator, which uh, under the hood uses the cruise control tool. And basically, when you do some scaling, and if you enable this auto-rebalancing, because it's, it's opt-in right now, then Strumzy will automatically use cruise control and trigger a rebalance to shift the data around within your, uh, your Kafka cluster. And uh, similarly, at scale down, before it actually removes the node, it will first start the rebalance to kind of remove the data from the node, which will be scaled down. And only once it's really empty, it will be actually deleted. So did we improve that? Do we have now a proper auto-scaling? Well, kind of. So what happens now with the enabled auto-rebalancing is that uh, yeah, when you start with the free node and the auto-scaling happens, then the new node is added to the cluster, and then the rebalancing happens, and it shifts some of the data to the new node. And uh, yeah, that looks great, right? We have now new, uh, new node, which has some data. The cluster is nicely balanced over. So that looks like uh, success. Similarly, when we would now scale down, then basically what Strimzy would do is uh, it would first move the data to one of the remaining nodes. And only then it would actually scale down the, the empty node and remove it. So that, that again, looks uh, pretty good. Now, the question is, what's really happening there under the surface of this? Uh, now, the reality might be that when you start with the free brokers, each of them has, for example, four terabytes 
of data stored in the brokers. Now, there are surely many Kafka clusters which have a lot less data stored in, uh, in each broker, but there are also many clusters which have way more than four terabytes stored in each broker. So yeah, it's kind of an example, but it's not completely unrealistic. Now, when we add the new broker to the cluster, it starts with an empty storage, so it has zero. And then the rebalance happens, and it kind of roughly equals it out. So now instead of three brokers with four terabytes and uh, one empty, we have four brokers with three terabytes each. And what that really means is that we basically had to shift three terabytes of data around from the old node to the new node. And uh, it works, but obviously moving three terabytes of data around means uh, you need some network resources because you need to shift this over network. You need some storage I.O. because you need to read it from the disks. Then on the new node, you need to write it to the disk. Uh, you need some CPU because uh, you have encryption, surely, and all these things around. And uh, most of all, you also need time because moving three terabytes of data is not something that happens uh, within a few seconds as the animation on the slide happened, right? And the same would happen if you, if you scale it down. So, uh, yeah, this is not perfect. And, uh, yeah, it works, but it's kind of, let's try to improve it. And the thing which comes to help here is uh, something called tiered storage. So it's a relatively new feature in, uh, in Kafka, but you might know it from other applications and uh, uh, as well. And it basically means that kind of, you use different tiers, different levels of storage in your Kafka cluster. And some of the data which are maybe not that important, not that often accessed, uh, uh, not that fresh, they will be offloaded into the other tier of the storage. And locally, you would keep mainly the data which are important, which are often accessed again and again, or which are just uh, received from the producers. And typically, the, the, the other tier of the storage which you add would be something like uh, Amazon AWS S3 storage or other types of object storage or some NFS storage, which kind of, uh, they typically are cheaper than uh, the block storage used directly by the brokers. They uh, typically allow you for much higher capacity than uh, the block storage. But also, in most cases, kind of the, the downside of them is that they often have bigger latency and, uh, and things like that. So uh, it's kind of a trade-off, but if we use the tiered storage to have less data on uh, the brokers, then we need to shift less data when we do the rebalancing, right? So now, if we would apply the tiered storage to the cluster which we had before, now suddenly we don't need to have four terabytes of data on each of the brokers. Maybe we have only 400 gigabytes of the data on each of the brokers, and then the rest is somewhere in the cloud in the Amazon S3 storage. So what happens now when we scale the cluster is we add the new node. The new node is again added with empty storage. We do the rebalance, and now after the rebalance, each of the nodes has only 300 gigabytes of the storage. And yeah, it might be still a lot, but it's 10 times less than uh, we had before, right? So it will cost you 10 times less resources on the networking, on the storage, but uh, also uh, roughly 10 times less, uh, less time. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the next piece which allows us to improve how quickly the cluster scales and uh, how quickly it can kind of happen. So let's try to get back to the, to the console and see if something happened. And what I can see here is uh, that here it created the broker number 13, and here it created the num broker number 14. So if you remember from the beginning, we had brokers 10, 11, and 12, three of them. So now we have 13 and 14, we have five of them. And then it also needs to restart the, the cruise control because cruise control needs to understand what's the cluster configuration, how many nodes does it have, uh, uh, what's the storage. So right now, kind of the way to update the configuration is by rolling the cruise control pod. So that's why you see it there as well. But if you can go somewhere else, then this is basically looking for the horizontal pod autoscaler. 
And this is where we started, right? There was pretty much no load on the cluster. This was the first part of the demo where I fired up the load and started uh, increasing it. And then, uh, yeah, this is where the horizontal pod autoscaler saw that it needs to scale up the Kafka cluster and it kind of first move it to four nodes, then move it to five nodes, and that's the 13 and 14 which we saw being added. And then when I go here, so this is the auto rebalancing which was triggered by Strimzy. So here at the beginning, I have kind of a template which just tells Strimzy and Cruise Control what are the default rules with which it should calculate the, how the data will be now spread across the cluster. And then this, uh, this add brokers uh, rebalance is basically what happened after the, after the scale up when it started shifting the data around uh, in the cluster. So it's now ready, which means that it uh, completed. So let me check. Uh, let me try to exec into one of the pods and list the topics. It's a demo, so I don't have it completely secure, so that's why I don't see any certificates and users and so on. But uh, if I go here, for example, to the load test topic, which is used by the, by the jobs generating the load, you can see, so this one is still on the original nodes, 10, 11, 12. This one is already on the node 14, so one replica was moved. This is 13, 13. 14, 13. So you can see how the different partition replicas of the Kafka cluster are now not only on the old brokers, but are now using the new brokers as well. So yeah, nice. Uh, I'm glad the demo worked. Uh, and we saw the auto scaling. Uh, and uh, now let me show you how I actually deployed it. Uh, and later I will share the link to the, to the GitHub where I have the YAML files, but basically, this is the Streamzy, these are the Streamzy custom resources which I used to deploy this, this cluster. So this is just the normal Kafka custom resource of Streamzy. I specify here a custom image which I want to use because the tiered storage plugins are currently not shipped in the default Streamzy image. So this is a custom image where I just edit the, the plugin for it. But otherwise it's, uh, it's just using the last Streamzy release 044. And, uh, then here in this section, I actually configured a tiered storage. So it's using the, the tiered storage plugin from, uh, from Ivan. Uh, and in my case, I'm using the NFS storage as the tiered storage. So yeah, I just configure kind of where the volume is, uh, is mounted and I tell it to use the file system storage plugin. And uh, then this is another important part. So this is the configuration of the auto rebalancing where I enable this feature in Streamzy, so I can enable it separately for adding brokers when scaling up, or for removing brokers for scaling down, and I can also specify this template which says uh, what are the, the algorithms I want to use to kind of rebalance the data, uh, which is optional. If you want to use the default, you don't need to specify it. And then here we have the Kafka node pool. So this is the one for the craft controllers. We are not scaling those. You don't need to auto scale those. Normally you don't, uh, don't really touch these. They are just free nodes. But this is the node pool for the Kafka brokers. And this is what we are actually auto scaling in the demo. So these are the actual brokers. Uh, and uh, the important part here is that uh, yeah, here I kind of mount the additional NFS volume, which is used as the, as the tiered storage so that it's available in the, in the brokers and can be used to offload the data. And then finally, this is just the, the Kafka rebalance, which I used as a template. So I just give it the rules that it should try to kind of optimize for all of these distributions of uh, replica leaders, disk usage, CPU usage, and, uh, and so on. So that's how I deployed the Kafka cluster. Uh, this is just the topic I used for the, for the load test. So what's important is it has 100 partition, it has replication factor free, and then of course uh, I had to enable the tiered storage for this topic. And then uh, last but not least, this is the horizontal pod autoscaler YAML. So 
I basically tell it that I want to scale this uh, Kafka node pool named Broker. Uh, in this demo, I want to scale it between three and five replicas. And uh, really for demo purposes, I'm just using the CPU utilization as the metric to scale it on. And uh, I uh, configure it to target 90% uh, average uh, utilization. And uh, then I have to configure some kind of uh, stabilization windows and kind of timings. And uh, I will get uh, in a minute to more why that's uh, important. So that's kind of the, the demo, uh, just for the sake of fun. Let's uh, stop the load now. And maybe later after the talk uh, on the hallway, we should be able to see that it actually scaled down again. So back to the demo. Uh, this is where you can find the, the YAMLs uh, which I use there. On uh, It just redirects to, to GitHub. The GitHub URL is too long. Uh, the slides are also on the, on the schedule, so you can find it there uh, as well. And uh, so it, the autoscaling worked really, but uh, between the first part of the demo when I started the load and when I actually checked the result, it took roughly 10 minutes. And uh, it normally doesn't need the full 10 minutes, but uh, yeah, in the, in the demo you can expect that uh, it roughly takes uh, several minutes uh, after the scaling happens to finish the rebalance and so on. Now, this might differ for every user. It depends how big your cluster is, how many data does it have, how much performance. So now in the demo, maybe you saw it in the, in the files. Uh, I, for example, had pretty small cluster with just like two gigs of RAM for node and a little bit of CPU. Uh, I think the storage which was there, it was roughly 100 gigabytes of storage per broker, including the tiered storage. So, so it wasn't the biggest cluster. It wasn't the biggest load. If you do it uh, with a more better sized cluster, you would typically have more data, so it would take a bit longer, but you would have more resources there, so that would take it again faster. So uh, with the bigger cluster, it was roughly the same, but uh, uh, yeah, it might differ depending on your cluster. But yeah, there are still some challenges which make this not perfect, the, the time is one of them. So if it takes several minutes to scale up, it means that, uh, yeah, maybe you should not wait for when you have millions of users forming your application because they saw it somewhere. Uh, maybe it will need some time. But one thing to keep in mind is that the scaling is expensive, right? So what actually happens when you scale up or scale down is that the rebalance starts booming around the data and that costs you the resources. So that's why it's important to properly configure these timings of the horizontal port autoscaler because, for example, if the horizontal port autoscaler would see that the cluster is underutilized and would scale it down, then the first thing which happens is that uh, the load goes immediately up because it starts moving the data around. So you want to avoid that the horizontal port autoscaler now immediately says, oh wait, load is up again, let's scale it up and kind of place this, this game up and down, right? So that's why it's important to kind of have these stabilization windows and so on configured for the proper time which it takes to do the scaling to avoid this kind of uh, going up and down. And uh, similarly, if you would do the auto scaling, then it's good to kind of do the auto scaling when you still have some performance space there and not wait when the cluster is already under heavy load because you will actually need some additional load to shift the data around and get the use of the new node. So, so that's something what's quite uh, important. Uh, other challenge is that uh, yeah, starting the new pod, that's fast. What takes several minutes is moving the data around. And that's not easy to, to address. Obviously, one of the solutions would be to have uh, uh, separation of the storage and the compute nodes to basically use tiered storage for everything, right? Because then you actually don't have any local data to move and you can just auto scale. Uh, and there are messaging systems or streaming platforms which, which do this, but uh, the thing is using only the tiered storage, using only something like uh, S3 object storage, uh, it works in some use cases, but it doesn't work in many other use cases. So it's yeah, it might help someone, but it's not the general solution for everything. And in fact, 
in the demo, I quite heavily relied on the tiered storage, but the tiered storage itself is something what yeah, might work for you, but might not work for you. If your cluster is full of some data you use for some model training or model validation, and the data are kind of consumed again and again and again and again, and you store it somewhere in Amazon S3, it suddenly might not be that cheap anymore because you actually pay for the, for the requests and, uh, and for the data. So, uh, yeah, it's important uh, how much data you have and how well the tiered storage really uh, fits uh, your your use cases. Uh, another thing to consider is what's the right metric to do the scaling on. Now, for the simplicity, I use the, use the CPU utilization, but Kafka has various different metrics, for example, which cover utilization of different uh, thread pools it's using internally and so on. So, yeah, I, I didn't really go into the detail, and to be honest, I'm more on the Strumzy side of things than on the Kafka side of things. So. Uh, uh, maybe some of these metrics would kind of work better in different uh, configurations in different clusters. And uh, one can obviously think whether uh, we should have some Kafka aware autoscaler, like for the Kafka consumers, uh, Keda has support for autoscaling them, where it kind of takes into account how is your topic configured, how many partitions does it have, how many parallel consumers you can actually have. And, Obviously, right now, here for the auto-scaling, we don't have anything like that. And if you would have the free brokers and all your load would be concentrated into free partitions, then uh, yeah, adding fourth or fifth node doesn't really help with it. If you have the load like I had it spread over 100 partitions, then it's kind of easy to spread it over the new nodes. Uh, and uh, the final kind of issue to consider is uh, whether your cluster actually has free capacity for, uh, for the auto-scaling, right? Uh, Kafka is often pretty big workload. It's often 64, 100 gigs of RAM, 10 CPUs per broker. And uh, uh, it's not unusual that when you actually try to scale it, you might not have capacity in your cluster to actually start this pot on. Now, if you run on premise, you simply might need to have the servers there. If you run in some cloud environments, then yeah, the cluster autoscalers for Kubernetes might help with this, something like Carpenter, for example. But what really happens when you use that, right? So the horizontal pod autoscaler scales the Kafka cluster, Streamsy sees the, the scale up, it creates the new pod. The new pod doesn't have anywhere to run, so it gets into the pending mode. The cluster autoscaler will see that there's pending pod, so it will get the new host provisioned, it will have to get it ready. Then once it's ready, the pod can actually start there, uh, and uh, the rebalance can happen once it's running. So it actually works. It's not like it's a, a blocker, but the scaling up, which was already quite long because of moving the data, is now even longer because maybe you need to wait for the new worker nodes to be provisioned for the new brokers to, to run on. Uh, that said, I don't really want to end on a, on a kind of negative note with a problem. So I think uh, uh, it was quite useful thing which we did. You can really scale the, the Kafka cluster. Uh, you just need to keep in mind to scale early. And uh, it's probably still a bit more suitable for this kind of mid or long term scaling to kind of, uh, for example, uh, scale down your cluster for weekends or for nights if uh, kind of your company or your applications follow this, this pattern of working hours. Uh, and uh, I think the thing to consider is also that sizing Kafka is pretty hard, and from my experience, there are plenty of very, very oversized Kafka clusters where someone simply didn't want it to take the risk that the cluster would be too small. And uh, yeah, maybe that's the uh, thing where the auto scaling can help as well because it might give you a bit more confidence to start with a smaller cluster and have it grow rather than over-provision everything. And uh, yeah, now if you would be interested to auto-scale your Kafka cluster, then uh, definitely let us know and help us kind of continue this journey, find us the right metrics, improve the things even more. So yeah, you can let us know on all the different uh, Streamsy channels. Uh, if you are interested more in streams in general, then tomorrow we will have a maintainer track talk uh, where yeah, we will cover more the general things. Uh, and otherwise, we are always looking for new contributors. So 
yeah, if you would be interested, uh, then uh, yeah, you can definitely join us. And that's it. And uh, I think we should have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, I think you should go to the to the mic so that it's on the on the record. My question is, uh, when the topic rebalance happens between the the newly added node, will the consumers see any like experience any issue errors and or slowness when that topic gets moved over to the new node? Yeah, so yeah, the consumers, so it depends which partition you are consuming, but if the, if the leader for your partition replica will be one of those things which are moved as part of the rebalance, the consumers will, will see it. Now, normally they should be able to just kind of find the new leader and just continue where they left, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good point. It's definitely kind of a disruption which happens on the, on the consumers as well as on the producers when the auto scaling uh, is happening. Okay, thank you. Yeah, kind of same thing uh, as him there. So, uh, did you see any the data ordering issue? So, if the auto scaler increased to auto scale and the data moves from one cluster to another, is the ordering of the data maintained? Or when auto scale down and the consumer is not you know, picked up anything yet and the yeah. data move back, right? The ordering of the data in the partitions yeah. is Good. maintained. So, so mm -hmm. what, what happens is that the auto scaling doesn't change the number of partitions or anything like that. It basically just takes the partition and moves it to the, to the new node. Mm -hmm. And the way it's done, it basically first creates, first keeps the original replicas, creates a new one, waits for the data to be copied, and then basically kind of switches over and deletes one of the old replicas. But the ordering uh, uh, okay. should be fine. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then uh, yeah, thanks for joining, and hopefully it was useful. <laughs>